I uh, write about the history of life for a living. And one of the occupational hazards of this line of work is that you keep wishing that you owned a time machine. If I had one, I might start by setting it to go back 520 million years. Uh, there wouldn't really be much to see on land, but in the oceans, you would get to see animals that are really pretty much nothing like life today. And after I was done swimming around and having my mind blown by the Cambrian life there, I might change the dial and go to 270 million years ago and look around on land. And again, see animals that are very different than anything alive today. 100 million years ago would be a good time to go to see the dinosaurs, to see the largest animals to walk on land. I could look up in the sky and see the largest animals to fly, the pterosaurs. 50 million years ago would have been just fine as well, because then I'd get to see some of the forerunners of today's mammals. So for example, I might be able to see an elephant with a teeny tiny trunk. Uh, there are no whales the way we know whales today. Um, instead, the whales back then were kind of like hairy alligators. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have a time machine. And so the best I can do is to um, look at fossils and talk to scientists who study those fossils. Uh, this is all we've got of the walking whales, uh, these bones. Uh, they're extinct. They evolved from an older ancestor. They had their day in the sun, or maybe two million years in the sun, and then they were gone. But even though all these species are extinct, we do know a few things about them. As weird as they might look, they all share the same genetic language that we use. They are all built from DNA. There are instructions in the DNA that can program a cell to develop into an embryo and into a, an adult form. So this actually raises, uh, naturally, an interesting possibility. Just imagine that someone handed you a thumb drive with the sequence of DNA for some extinct species. Just imagine that somehow you could get your hands on a DNA molecule with that matching sequence. Now again, just bear with me. Just imagine that you could get that DNA into a cell, and you could coax that cell to divide, and that it would become an embryo. Would you be able to bring back a species from extinction, something that hadn't seen the light of day for millions of years. Now, I don't have to really work that hard to get you to think about this, because 20 years ago, the movie Jurassic Park came out. So we all kind of have this in our heads. And we kind of vaguely think it's a bad idea. <laughs> as imaginative as Jurassic Park was, uh, it kind of falls down, we realize now, on the science. So just to refresh your memory, the whole idea that you could clone a dinosaur came from the notion that there were mosquitoes drinking dinosaur blood, getting trapped in amber, and if you could somehow find those mosquitoes today in amber, you could pull out dinosaur DNA and voila, dinosaur. That will not work. We're not going to be talking to you today about bringing back dinosaurs, um, unless you count birds as dinosaurs, which you should. Uh, the problem is the DNA falls apart. After an animal dies, enzymes start slicing apart the DNA, bacteria start munching on it. Um, basically, you're just left with a bunch of fragments. And actually, scientists have been able to uh, estimate the rate at which this fragmentation happens. So DNA is a bit like uranium in that it has a half-life. Um, if you have a sample of DNA, it starts to fragment and gets smaller and smaller, and you have less and less of that DNA. And you're losing a lot of it over the course of just centuries, not tens of millions of years. But even if it's not possible to bring back a dinosaur from the Jurassic, some new research raises the prospect that we might be able to bring back more recently extinct species. And I'll just give you a quick overview of a couple of the main areas of development. So first of all, cloning. About three years after uh, Jurassic Park came out, uh, scientists came out 
with the announcement that they had cloned the first mammal, Dolly the sheep. Uh, it was a difficult endeavor. Um, it involved a lot of failure. And Dolly herself did not actually live very long. But the fact is that cloning has made huge advances since then. So now hundreds of animals are cloned every year. And scientists can do cloning with some pretty remarkable material. This is a mouse that was frozen for 16 years. Scientists in Japan pulled out some of its cells. And out of those cells, they were able to pull nuclei, that is, the sacs that hold their DNA. And they inserted these nuclei into mouse eggs. And from one of those mouse eggs, they got a mouse. This mouse was, in fact, healthy enough that it had mouse pups of her own. So bear in mind, this is a clone of something that had been dead and frozen for 16 years. So it is reasonable to ask whether it might be possible to find frozen material from an extinct species. So mammoths, for example, became extinct 3,400 years ago. And there's frozen tissue of mammoths lying around in Siberia and Canada and the Arctic. Um, and so perhaps in that tissue, there might just be a viable nucleus that you could do this kind of a, a procedure with. But actually, we don't just have to hope that we find one intact nucleus of an extinct species. There are other possibilities now that scientists are exploring. So remember that I told you that DNA just falls apart into lots of little fragments. Uh, scientists can actually go out and look for those fragments and piece them back together to understand what the original genes look like. You can think of it like taking the joy of cooking and just running it through a paper shredder. Uh, let's say that you, know, you came by an office and there was a giant garbage bag full of those shredded pieces of paper. Even better, let's say that somebody, for some reason, decided to shred 100 copies of The Joy of Cooking and threw them in the trash. Now, if you took them home and were very patient, you'd start to find pieces that lined up. And they might overlap. And you could build out parts of the cookbook. That's essentially what scientists do to build out the sequence of species that are extinct. And they can get this material in all sorts of remarkable places. So uh, there's DNA that scientists can get from the fossils of saber-toothed cats, which have been extinct for about 10,000 years. And they're started, they've started to build out some of the sequences of saber-toothed cat genes. But it's not just fossil bones that you can look at. Giant ground sloths, huge, magnificent animals that walked around North America up until about 10,000 years ago. They would eat a lot of leaves and other plant material and they produced a lot of dung. And that dung fossilizes. And it turns out that in that dung, there are fragments of ground sloth DNA. And so scientists are actually rebuilding the ground sloth genome by looking at the DNA that's left behind in 10,000-year-old dung. And if that wasn't remarkable enough, you can actually get DNA out of ancient eggshells. The elephant bird of Madagascar went extinct 1,800 years ago. This is an incredible animal that uh, grew to be 10 feet tall, weigh 1,000 pounds. And scientists can actually pull out bits of DNA from fossil eggshells that is left behind. You can even get DNA out of the dirt. Scientists go to Alaska and go through the permafrost and pull out bits of DNA, and they can actually recognize mammoth DNA there. And so they can use that to help assemble the mammoth genome. And actually, between the, the DNA in the dirt and the DNA in frozen mammoth tissue, we actually have a pretty good view of the whole mammoth genome. So scientists can actually look at the genes and say, well, what does it take to be a mammoth? Uh, what, what gives some mammoths hair? How are they able to survive in Siberia or in Alaska? George Church at Harvard and other people have recognized a way to use this kind of information to possibly bring back species from extinction. The thing is that we're not at the point where you can reconstruct a whole DNA molecule just based on a sequence. That's beyond us right now. 
However, Church and others are able to synthesize fairly large chunks of DNA. So, what if you could identify those places in the mammoth genome that really mattered, that made a mammoth different than an elephant? And then you paste those, as it were, into the genome of an Asian elephant. And you have a cell of Asian elephant DNA which has these mammoth genes in it, and now you implant that and see what comes of it. Do you give rise to a mammoth? So we're at the point where we can actually start to ask if we should do this. This isn't purely science fiction. This is a proposition. And with all scientific propositions, we have to think seriously about whether this is a good, good idea or not. Now, people who only think in terms of Jurassic Park might say, this is a bad idea. You know, the, the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park were the ultimate invasive species. You don't want to do this. Horrible things will happen. But remember, I just told you that dinosaurs are off the table. Instead, think about another giant animal. Think, for example, about the stellar sea cow, which is about as big as Tyrannosaurus rex. This is a relative of manatees that lived in the North Pacific. And it was in huge numbers up until the 1700s. And then we hunted them to death. We ate them all. Uh, they were great food for sailors. You could feed a crew of 33 for a month with one stellar sea cow. And so this animal was discovered in 1741, and the last one was seen in 1768. We know exactly how they went extinct. It was us. So you can argue, do we have an obligation to bring them back? And perhaps there's not much of a risk of them running amok. I doubt that you would have to worry about a stellar sea cow eating you. Now, the stellar sea cow extinction is just one of, unfortunately, many extinctions uh, that have happened in the past few centuries. If you compare the extinctions that have happened recently to what you see in the fossil record, you can see that in some groups, like mammals and birds and amphibians, uh, we are going way beyond the way it used to be. We're about maybe 100 or 1,000 times higher than before. And projections, when you look at endangered species and the threats they face, pollution and so on, you're looking perhaps at 10,000 times the background rate of extinction. So we could be entering the sixth mass extinction in the past half billion years. Really, it's up to us and what we do that decides whether we end up on that list. So perhaps the extinction could be a part of the strategy that keeps us from getting on that list. And just to give you one example of how this might work, consider the Red River giant soft-shelled turtle. This is a magnificent animal. It gets to be 200 pounds. There are only four of them left alive. Two of them are in Vietnam. Two of them are in China. And with the technology we have right now, when they die, their species goes with them, and we have no way of bringing them back. So could de-extinction be a way of buying ourselves more time? Could we find a way to actually uh, get them to produce more numbers, to actually bring this species back into a healthy state? It's a possibility, and one that might be worth examining. But if scientists are able to bring back a species like the Red River giant soft-shelled turtle, there's another really important question. What do you do with it? Well, you could say, well, let's just put it back where it came from. This is where it came from. It came from rivers and lakes in East Asia, which are now incredibly polluted. Some of these lakes are uh, regularly overwhelmed with toxic algae produced as a result of heavy pollution. If you go to all the work to bring back these turtles and you put them back in this environment, they're going to go extinct again. So when we think about de-extinction and bringing species back from the past, Maybe we have to think about bringing the world back as well. Thank you very much.